This podcast is brought to you by PLI, the Practicing Law Institute. PLI is committed to keeping you ever current on the dynamic trends shaping the legal world. Learn more at pli.edu slash ftpod. Welcome to Fast Tracked, Emergent Issues in the Legal Profession, brought to you by the Practicing Law Institute. I'm your host, Jen Leonard, founder of Creative Lawyers. Buckle up as we hit the gas and explore the most dynamic trends shaping the legal world, from generative AI to DE&I and everything in between. I hope you'll join us as we explore the future of law today. On today's episode, we hear from Diana Cortez, a partner with Morgan Lewis and former city solicitor for the City of Philadelphia Law Department, and Jesse Spressart, the founder of Optia Consulting, about the future of intergenerational workforces in the legal profession. I hope you enjoy this insightful discussion. Welcome, everybody. I am your host, Jen Leonard, the host of the Fast Tracked podcast for Practicing Law Institute, where we explore all the converging dynamics that are forcing an exciting era of change in the legal profession. And to help us navigate that change on each episode, we welcome two experts to discuss one element of what we're all experiencing in this disorienting but also exciting time. And today on our episode, we are going to talk about intergenerational dynamics. This is the most intergenerational workforce we have ever had in our profession, which creates some challenges, but also offers enormous opportunities to think differently about the future of law firms. And I am just thrilled today to welcome to the audience two experts to guide us through everything that's happening inside of a law firm. Our experts today are Diana Cortez, who is a partner with Morgan Lewis, and Diana most recently served as the city solicitor for the city of Philadelphia, which is the chief civil legal officer for the city and handles many legal issues and oversees a dozen departments. She also oversees about 300 legal professionals. And by the way, she did all of this during COVID. So Diana has... (laughs) earned her stripes on the ground, leading a very intergenerational workforce during a very complex time, and we're thrilled to welcome her. And joining Diana is Jesse Spressart, who is the founder of Optia Consulting. Jesse is a coach, a facilitator, and she works with law firms to try to organize their approaches to all of these complex issues, including intergenerational dynamics. So I'm just delighted to have Diana and Jesse walk us through everything today. And to level set, we wanted to start off with really understanding what makes these generations so complex when they all come together and try to move forward in their work in a way that is aligned, but also brings out the best in each of them. And I want to start by saying that we recognize that everybody is an individual. Everybody has their own qualities and attributes. All of that said, I think that we all know that each generation has some hallmarks, some behaviors that we can attribute to that generation's experience in the world. And so to get us started, Jesse, I would just love if you could walk us through what are the different generations right now coming together to work together and what are sort of the behaviors, the hallmarks, the attitudes, the perspectives of each of those generations? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I would start by saying the way that people develop over time, right? Human development from a psychological perspective, that has not changed. We all go through the same types of stages of development. But when we think about generations, the main difference is the context in which we develop, right? So when we talk about generations, we're thinking of kind of the global context where people are coming up, what the exterior world is, how that's shaping us, right? So let's start with Gen Z, who are our youngest generation in the workforce. There's actually another generation after them, but they're still at school. They're not in the workforce. We're not focused on them quite yet. But Gen Z are folks who were born around 1996 to 2015-ish. So these are our youngest lawyers and legal professionals entering legal organizations. 
they have grown up in a post 9-11 world. They don't really have an idea of what life was like before fast internet. We call them digital natives. Social media is part and parcel of their experience, which is very different from every generation ahead of them. And they are com- they've been coming of age in the pandemic. Right. So folks who are entering the legal organizations now finished college or law school on Zoom and are in a space where they are much more separated physically. Right. And we're going to talk about return to office. It's a very different experience for them. Millennials are folks who were born roughly 1981 to 1995. Their experience was shaped by Columbine and mass shootings in high school. So millennials and Gen Z have in common this experience of expecting violence. And and this sounds terrible, right? But it is the world in which they've grown up. They remember a world before instant internet access, right? Dial up and modem, but modern technology has always been a part of their lives. So they are a little bit more between the older folks who, you know, remember payphones. (laughs) <laughs> the younger folks who are like, why would I put it? I don't even have change in my pocket to put into a, a and what am I supposed to do? Dial, right? So that they're kind of like in that space. Gen X are one of it's one of the smallest generations, and we're all here to represent that. 1965 to 1980. And we came of age during the AIDS epidemic. We watched the fall of the Berlin Wall. We experienced the first dot-com boom and bust. We remember home computers. You may have had a Commodore 64 or one of the original Macs. And so our experience is really in the space of emerging technology. And I talk a lot about technology when I talk about generations because it gives us that good sense of like where we were, what kind of technology you were using as we were coming of age. Because I think that actually impacts us in the legal industry, thinking about how we are processing all of the information that's coming through because that's what we do, right, in in this space. And then we have our baby boomers. So baby boomers are the post-World War II kids, and they were a huge generation in terms of numbers, right? So they are the ones who are senior leaders in law firms. Gen X are coming into the senior leadership position as they're, you know, taking on more leadership roles. But we're even seeing millennials in the partnership ranks and starting to move up. So when we're talking about so many different generations all at the same time, we're talking, you know, in the leadership ranks, it's not the hierarchies are mixing when it's coming into a generational perspective. But our baby boomers are folks who uh, we, you know, did everything on word processors or typewriters, legal pads, and it was a much more analog world than a digital world. And what some of the tensions we see really come out of this sense of how different that processing was and how they did things versus how things are done now. And I'm sure we'll talk more about that. And then we have still some of the elder statesmen and women, the traditionalists who were born prior to 1945. And these are the folks who are the keepers of the history of our firms and our organizations. And They are still in it because they love the work. They love the law. They love being in the space in which they have spent their lives. And that is one of the other generational differences is this, and again, broadly speaking, right? A definition of who you are by what you do, both within your career and outside of it. And we're seeing a shift from the older folks to the younger folks with how they define who they are based on what they do. So that's just a little overview. Amazing. Thank you so much, Jesse. And just for the record, I am Gen X and I had an Apple II GS, which I <laughs> very clearly remember getting because my dad got frustrated because it took about 10 minutes to start up and he had no patience. And I had that printer paper where you had to oh, tear the dot off matrix. the borders. Yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> you know. To print Take out. forever to print a page. <laughs> That's right. My students would be horrified if they saw what we used to have to do to hand in a report. But, you know, I really appreciate the focus on technology. We have four other episodes this season where we talk about generative AI and its impact on the future. But as you note, Jesse, technology impacts each generation. 
And Diana, certainly about four years ago, regardless of your generation, we were all thrust into the chaos that was COVID shutdown. And fortunately, this wasn't the era of Apple IIGS. This was the era of high-speed internet access and Zoom and other remote platforms. So we were all able to sort of instantly pivot and get online Mm -hmm. and continue doing our work. Lots of really challenging things happened in the process. But you were actually sitting in the chair of a leader of an already sort of complex, I keep saying complex, but the word of the era is complexity, organization Mm -hmm. where people are doing lots of different types of work. They're moving around from the office to their clients to courthouses. They're sort of all over the place at the city. And you're dealing with all of these generations trying to work together. Just walk us through what it was like maybe for you as a leader to try to get your arms around what the (laughs) heck do we do now? And also, how did that experience surface some of the differences that Jesse talked about with respect to the different generations on your teams? Sure. So when the pandemic started, I was part of the executive team at the City of Philadelphia Law Department. So definitely, to your point, had a front row seat to how do we, especially as a municipality, right, that the idea of remote work, it was just that. It was an idea and it was given to people under very limited and special circumstances. So everyone was in the office every day. And so to have to pivot from that, from one day to the next, once it w- once everyone realized this, the pandemic wasn't going anywhere anytime soon, it was pretty remarkable just how the city all as a whole realized that we needed to function in order to maintain operations as limited as they may have been out, you know, throughout different points of the pandemic, but we had to move on. And so we adjusted. And I think that's sort of also an ongoing trait in humanity, <laughs> just trying to find a way to survive and adapt. And so even the a municipality that traditionally is filled with bureaucracy <laughs> and roadblocks, we were able to get through it. And I think within a couple of months, everyone did have their own laptop and was able to work remotely. And I think there was, it was interesting because I think right at the height of the pandemic, there were different reactions that... I don't, there were different reactions from different generations, but I still think there was that sense of uncertainty and a little bit of fear as well, especially pre-vaccine. So a lot of people did not want to come in. That sense of, you know, we'll talk about it, I guess, a little bit later as the hybrid and things like that. But, you know, especially those who were in a more vulnerable age group, they weren't trying to come anywhere near the office. So they were really embracing working remotely and being with family. And I think also you then go to the other side, the millennials or Gen Xs, maybe even some Gen Zs, not sure, but those with younger children who were really, you know, embracing that time and had to basically be home and be everything to their families. So it was, it was an ongoing, it was a very, to go with the theme of complexity. It was a time (laughs) filled with complexities because we had to adjust immediately to the technological need, but also recognize that this entire workforce needed our support as leaders and our encouragement as well to make sure to let them know that, look, we are here for you. We are going through the same thing as well. And however we can be supportive of you, that is what we were going to do. That was the theme of our law department always. So we got through that. And I think the clients were also very appreciative of just how responsive everybody was, especially, you know, during the civil unrest and the riots and everything. No, nobody in the law department like missed a beat. So everyone was very appreciative of that. And then as we move on to the vaccine policies, and then once people were able, once the vaccines came out and different groups were allowed to get them. Then came, you know, the idea of hybrid, of having people come back in. And then there, it was also interesting in trying to think of, was there a clear trend among generations? I don't know if I would necessarily say that it was based off of 
their generation. I think it was, I think I saw a lot of people depending on whether they were a supervisor versus a line attorney versus a professional staff. And I think you also had sort of differences between caregivers and non-caregivers. What I experienced as a solicitor was that 99% of the middle managers wanted me to decide <laughs> the edict, whatever it was, and that for the most part, they wanted more. They wanted people to be in the office more often because I think it's just difficult to manage virtually. It's additional check-ins that you have to do. You have to be more intentional. And I think all of us have experienced like being a manager is it's a different level of stress and concerns. So I think to they thought since you know we're coming back in, let's try to minimize that. And it would be minimized if everybody were in the office a certain number of days. So I think it was definitely a learning process throughout it all. And so I don't think at least my experience in the law department, I don't think I necessarily saw it with baby boomers and Gen Xers. And I think maybe we had a few traditionalists, not sure, didn't want to ask because that's a whole other <laughs> issue with you. But I think, you know, for the most part, you would think that those folks wanted to come in more to the office. But I think in the very beginning, because there was still that concern of how effective is this vaccine going to be? And again, they were more vulnerable in those more vulnerable populations. I did see a number that were in that group be okay and actually want to continue remote work. At least that's what I saw. I'll leave it up to like you, Jen, or Jesse, as to like other observations you may have seen in that time period. Yeah. And as you were talking, Diana, it occurred to me that your office, you mentioned the social unrest during 2020 in particular, that your office would have been involved also in counseling the police department mm -hmm. um, yes. and the other first responders in Philadelphia. So it's it, also an interesting practice. It reminds me of conversations we've had with lawyers working in big pharma who were working mm -hmm. on vaccine rollout. So was there an added element that was in some ways helpful in the sense that people really wanted to be involved in an important moment in time through their legal work. How did that play out? I think definitely. I think, you know, you have also seen it in your time at the city that I, I think the city of Philadelphia is very blessed to have such dedicated public servants and great attorneys who are just committed to this cause. So I think it already attracts those type of people who want to be all in. But ex absolutely, Jen, to your point, I think the fact that the city being in crisis, as were many other major cities at that same time, made them want to answer the call, absolutely, and be there in any way, shape, or form that, that they were needed. I think it did help that we were willing to meet them where they were at and not re necessarily require them to come into the office to have these discussions. Mm -hmm. You know, we could discuss things remotely. We could discuss things by phone, although the very important meetings where, excuse me, the client did want to meet in person, then obviously we would meet in person with, you know, whoever said client may have been in that particular <laughs> crisis. Yeah. So I think absolutely that definitely helped and that they were being part of that solution that was addressing the immediate crisis upon the city that they loved and have dedicated their professional lives to. Mm -hmm. Super interesting. And I would imagine if we zoomed into lots of different law firm practices, municipal practices, in-house practices, we would hear stories of how the lawyers were really motivate it to support mm -hmm. their clients during mm -hmm. all of these challenging times. I don't want to suggest at all that we're emerging from challenging times, but maybe we're at a place now where we can think a little bit more intentionally about leadership and how mm -hmm. we guide our workforces into the next era. And so Jesse, as somebody who has a bird's eye view of all of the challenging things that leaders like Diana have had to navigate over the last <laughs> few years, what are you doing to advise law firm leaders in particular at helping support, as Diana mentioned, some of the times it's the people leading the practice groups who really want support from the leaders. You want, you have your junior 
attorneys who want to yeah. learn and be mentored. You have your senior attorneys who maybe enjoy the flexibility they've never had in their career. So how does a leader start to respond to all of this? Yeah, you know, it's it's a challenge, <laughs> right? Because not everybody wants the same thing, like you just said. And so it, and I think the pandemic has only demonstrated that even further, right? Before the pandemic, there was a set way of doing things and people might have been chafing a little bit at the constriction, perhaps. But we now know that work can be done differently. And firms had record years, right, during the pandemic. And so we know that things don't have to be done the same way they always have been, nor will they be, right, with we've, we've been talking about AI and other techno technological things that are coming down the pipe. So before I talk a little bit about how we see lawyers and leaders actually needing to be different. I just wanted to, we've been talking about a few different words. Uh, I've heard volatility. I've heard uncertainty. I've talked, I've heard complexity. And there's actually a, a acronym that's VUCA. We live in a VUCA world and it is volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And that is the space in which we are all operating now. You know, even as we continue to emerge from the pandemic, there are other things that are coming to the fore that are keeping this volatility and ambiguity going on. And so it is incumbent on leaders to recognize that this is the space in which they have to lead. And so what I encourage law firm leaders to do is develop their listening skills. They're listening to understand, they're listening to be present versus they're listening to answer or fix. This is a different skill set than they have been that, than they have developed over the course of their careers as lawyers, right? Who they have learned to listen to advice. And it's a different way of listening and responding to understand what all of the different viewpoints are, what all of the different needs are. And it's really challenging <laughs> to meet all of them. And it's not always possible, but how can we? be there as much as possible for as many people as possible, focusing on their well-being, focusing on diversity and inclusion, focusing on making each person feel like they are part of a larger organization, which Diana, I can tell from what you were saying was a big part of the work that you have had to be doing over the last several years. And so this shift towards a different skill set then will help people really be able to move their organizations forward in a way that is taking the whole in versus just how we've always done things. Yeah, I really appreciate you saying that, Jesse. And looking back, I wish we would have known each other and I would have asked you for a consultation <laughs> when I was in the <laughs> middle of in during my tenure as city solicitor, as we were moving to implement a hybrid mm -hmm. work schedule. So I, you know, I discussed it with my executive team and everyone was like, you know, everyone's has their vaccine. Lawyers tend to be very risk averse. So we had like 99% of our workforce vaccined and everyone thought, okay, we'll just do three days a week and we'll give everyone one month's notice. It'll be, you know, it'll be great. We, roll it out. We put out a PowerPoint that we thought answered all the different questions. And then we start hearing like grumblings. We start hearing like people are very worried. They're very anxious. They don't like this. And it was constant, right? It's one thing that it was just here and there, but it was constant. And so I decided in discussions with the executive team, I said, no, let's start having this listening, what we coined as a listening tour. Mm -hmm. And I want to make sure that everyone, I want to hear directly from people because that was the other thing I was, we were also depending, I think a lot of, we weren't talking directly with the people with these issues too, with these questions and these concerns. So we were relying sort of like on our middle managers, which I think they were relaying the information that was relayed to them mm -hmm. to be fair. So we had, we set up these different listening sessions, tried to make sure we got a good mix of people and I started off every conversation saying, we're not, I, we cannot create a policy that will make everyone happy. Right. And that is not the goal. So 
So I'm just letting you all know, whatever I <laughs> set those, whatever set comes those expectations. Out, <laughs> yes, whatever comes yeah. out, this is. But what I do want is to hear it, and then that will help inform me. Like the purpose of this for me is to hear directly from you. And what are, you know, what are those concerns? What am I missing? Because that was the other thing that I wanted mm-hmm. to make sure as a leader that I wasn't missing anything. That even if, again, people didn't like it, at least I would have considered it. And I came up, you know, there was a reason why or why not to, res- to uh, accept what was being proposed. So long story short, we did end up changing it. To just one day a week because I wanted to emphasize flexibility because that was the biggest concern from people. And I did give the middle managers the option of increasing that day depending on their particular client needs Mm -hmm. or their operational needs. And then the one day a week, everyone had to be in because that was the other thing with hybrid of being in the office was that, oh, there needs to be in-person work camaraderie. People need to learn from each other. But if everyone's coming in a different day, you're not going to learn from each other. So we had to make sure that everybody was coming in on the same day. And again, not everyone (laughs) was happy, but I definitely think that having, admitting that, okay, we're, that was a mistake or that was an oversight. And this is the process. And really, involving everybody at those different levels to at least let them have a space receive I received a lot of good feedback from different people about that and I think you know moving forward it it was a much different environment and so I think the trust definitely was enhanced so just yeah yeah. yeah. I wish I would have talked to you back (laughs) in 2021 (laughs) Yeah, I wish I'd had a chance to talk to a lot of folks because I think we could have done things a little bit differently, right? A lot of legal organizations are used to just saying, this is how it's going to be and like it or lump it, right? And the pushback was pretty consistent across a lot of different firms, a lot of different organizations, and they realized that didn't really work. And part of that is because not everybody wants the same thing, right? And so when we think generationally, right, we are seeing that is one of uh, the changes that we see as our younger folks, our Gen Z and millennials are committed to the work that they're doing now, but they may or may not want to be partner. They may, they might see what firm leadership looks like and say, that's not for me. And so when we're thinking of leadership and how we're developing people and how we're helping people meet their potential while keeping our organizations successful, right? And profitable and all of those important things is what do we need to do to develop our younger folks in a way that is going to meet their needs and meet the needs of the organization, but may not look the same that it used to, right? And what might that look like? And that requires input (laughs) from people and not just thinking, well, this is how it's been before. Let's try and fit that square peg into a round hole that we now have. So it's a continue, continual iteration, I think, that we need to be paying attention to. And that requires hearing people. It requires making sure that people feel heard. Because even like you said, Diana, I love this. Like you, you set that expectation of we're not going to be able to make everybody happy, but we do want to hear what it is you're looking for so we can do as much as we can. Can I focus on this last point a little bit more? And some of the things that I'm hearing from both of you are so consistent with what I hear from other people, including people trained in the field of psychology. And Jesse, I know that you have a degree in positive psychology and the idea that once you give people agency over the way that they mm-hmm. work, that is a very tough thing to undo. People love Undo, agency. yes. <laughs> right. Yes. Um, and so- you know, I really applaud Diana, you going out and listening to everybody and making it clear this, you know, you may not like the final result of this, but the importance is that as an organization, we're contributing together to thinking this through. And maybe I'll start with you, Diana. And I want to also hear from you, Jesse. How do we ensure that everybody feels comfortable giving authentic feedback to these questions? Mm -hmm. I've worked the last decade with law students and junior lawyers who are alumni. And There's such a low level of trust, especially in firm environments, that what they're saying (laughs) is not going to come back to haunt them, right? They want to be seen as contributors, 
but they're dealing with this tension of, I also really want the kinds of flexibility that I've enjoyed or, you know, is the only type of work that I've ever known. So how do I make sure that we're getting candid feedback to inform the policies we're shaping? Diana? Yeah, that's a great question. I think firms and organizations have done it different ways. I know that here at Morgan Lewis, they've sent out numerous different surveys that predate my joining them. And I think that's sort of encouraging candid and authentic feedback and then discussing those results with everybody once they come up and show, look, the data came from you all that then dictated that the, this is going to be the policy. Mm-hmm. At the law department, we also used surveys as well. But also I tried to, from the time that I started as, you know, before I was solicitor, I was the chair of the litigation group, part of the executive team. Anytime I met with somebody, I tried to make it very clear to them, like, my job is to get it right. And if that means that I'm missing or misstating something, like I'm, I want you to tell me. I'm not here to have my ego stroked or to be told that I'm right when I'm wrong, because at the end of the day, that's not helping this department, its reputation, or more importantly, our client, the city of Philadelphia. So I think it's, I think the surveys and the request for feedback is a great first start, but I definitely think it has to be reinforced by those in leadership, that this is really an open space for that type of feedback, that we really do care. Mm -hmm. I think people are definitely going to judge you to see if your actions and your conduct are really mirroring your words. And I always try to make sure that I and the rest of the executive team and middle management, and I would encourage people like, This is what's supposed to, you know, this is the environment we're in. And if we're not, you need to tell me because I need to do something about it. I need to check somebody. I need to go out and make sure that is being implemented down the line. So I think that's sort of how you first go about it. And I think that sort of starts to address any levels of mistrust and then just that constant reinforcement of that, I would think would be helpful. Great. Yeah. Jesse, yeah. additional techniques leaders can use to create trust for authentic yes. feedback. So I, Diana, you just did an excellent job of describing a, one of my favorite frameworks from Frances Frey out of Harvard. She has a framework called the trust triangle. And Ooh. so if you visualize a simple triangle, right, we've got three points and Each point is one area where if you really want to build trust, you need to have a good strong point of that triangle. So the first one is logic, right? So I believe you're capable of doing what I'm asking you to do or learning, or please believe that we have a method by which we are seeking feedback, taking a survey, right? Going about collecting the information that we need. So we have logic as one point of our triangle, and then authenticity, right? So you were talking, Diana, about setting aside your ego. I'm here because I want to do the right thing. I want it to be, you know, the best thing. And so if I'm misunderstanding something, please let me know so that I can understand. That is you being authentic, right? So people need to believe that they are experiencing the real you versus an ego or a facade or some sort of mask, when they see that or they sense that, the trust is more likely to disappear. And then the third one, which honestly is the one that wobbles the most often in our environments, is empathy. So I believe that you care about me, about my success, right? That you actually care about what I'm saying and the feedback that I'm giving you. And so it's really hard to ask for authentic feedback and to take that feedback And for people to actually give that feedback, if they don't believe that you're going to do anything with it, if they don't believe that you're actually going to hear what's being said, if you're going to just be like, oh, they just are so entitled and want more than we're ever going to give them. And the kids these days, who do they think they are, right? That's a lack of empathy. That's a lack of really believing that a person is coming in good faith. And it shows bad faith on that side as well. So 
when you when any of those points on the trust triangle wobble, trust is not complete and trust starts to fail. So if you're looking for a way to think about how can you build that trust, see where you are, see where those wobbles might be, and how can you shore those points up? That's one of my favorite frameworks. It's so simple and straightforward. And anybody can just be like, oh, what's missing here? And when once you start to see that, then you know why that authentic feedback is not coming because there's something missing. I love that framework and especially the focus on empathy, Jesse. <laughs> and in a minute, I'm going to pivot to succession planning, but I just want to stop here on the empathy point because I know you've spoken, Jesse, about the idea that you sometimes hear senior lawyers, maybe even Gen X lawyers grumbling, you know, we've paid our dues and mm -hmm. this new generation, these kids today, they don't want to work hard. They don't want to come into the office. Mm -hmm. They want to do whatever they want. And you have framed it differently for me of thinking differently about what paying your dues means. So could you share a little bit about how we might reframe paying your dues and how younger, more junior generations have actually paid dues that in a lot of ways yeah. are much harder than the dues that we all paid. Yeah. You know, I don't think it needs to be a competition. And I think that what we should be doing is instead of a pulling a ladder up behind us and making the next generation build their own ladder and figure it out, we should leave the ladders down because there are other things at play. And I'm going to mix my metaphors here, but you know there are other things that our younger generations, Gen Z, like I was saying earlier when I was describing each generation, they went to law school on Zoom. They finished college on Zoom. That is something that nobody has ever had to do before. It's a completely different experience. And yes, we all worked on Zoom. We had to pivot quickly, but we were already established in our careers we already had those working relationships. This was kind of a pulling of the rug out and an expectation to still excel and be academic and pass the bar and do all of these things in a very confined, isolated space. That is a due that Gen Z is paying that nobody else has had to pay. And so when we see, and I do see this, I talk to firms all the time saying, oh, they don't have the social skills. They don't know what's expected of them. They don't know how to network. Well, of course not. <laughs> how are they supposed to do that? Right? You're doing it over Zoom. You're not doing it in person. So it's now incumbent on us to teach them what the expectations are and to help them learn how to do all of the things that they that we just kind of figured out as we went along. So that's where that empathy comes in, understanding that their experience is not ours. What can we learn from them while we're also teaching them and bringing them up behind us? Yeah. And Jesse, I also think the fact that Gen Z, and I'm technically a millennial, just FYI, but... I didn't want to ask. I didn't want to ask. It's okay. <laughs> I think we're on the cusp. Right on the cusp. I are right on the cusp. It's okay. Give me Gen X. <laughs> yeah, it's right on the cusp. I've been told I have an older soul, so maybe that's what it is. But anyways, I think also, in addition to everything you just said, I think the fact that the millennials, but in particular Gen Z, they grew up with the internet. They grew up with everything being immediately available to them. Like they, there's no waiting for anything. Like mm -hmm. you have access to the internet. You can request Google or Siri to answer like almost every question. And so I um, I wonder the fact that they've had access to that at such a young age and they grew up with that, just the idea of like that immediacy, but also that exposure to so many like traumatic things, even mm -hmm. if you put all the filters as a parent to your child or like even if they grew up with those filters and also, I don't know, how far back filters go with all of these things. They're just exposed, they were exposed to so many things. So I think also it'd be interesting to see, or I'm sure there's studies on this, just like the impact that trauma and empathy had on these generations mm -hmm. and just how that influenced them. And again, to your great point that we as, you know, perhaps not being in that generation or not, or having different experiences than the majority of those I think we also, again, if the goal is for the organizations to thrive, 
into the future. I think we all, like you very eloquently and excellently said, like we need to learn how to, I think, work with each other and motivate each other and not just see like, not just rinse and repeat what was done with us. I think really evaluating this current situation, try to anticipate what's ahead as well Mm -hmm. and think about how we can work with each other to better tackle those things. I love this whole conversation because I will jump to Gen Z's defense all the time. I get to teach them. I get to spend time with them. They are the smartest people I've ever met. um, And they are really excited about contributing to the profession. And I think to both of your points, our role as more senior lawyers, whether we're Gen X or millennials or boomers or the senior generation is to really help them figure out, you know, what that looks like for them. And then for our organizations, I really want to talk about the other side, the other point of the career journey where we spent our whole lives practicing law and we're getting ready to move into the next chapter of our life and retire. And Jesse, you know, succession planning, the more time I spend with law firms, the more that phrase comes up Mm -hmm. frequently as the biggest challenge in the next two to three years. We have a whole big generation of partners who have been bringing in revenue for our firms about to retire. And Mm -hmm. succession planning has really been a challenge for law firms. And then, you know, on the other side, in the incoming point, we have generations where people aren't necessarily feeling compelled to be as loyal to their firms. They want to, you know, they grew up in this era where there isn't a lot of trust in institutions, rightly so. And so how do we help law firms think about building succession planning approach that honors and empathizes with the people who are about to move into the next chapter, Mm -hmm. but also reinforces the strength of the revenue model for the firm with the generations coming up behind? That's a really great question. And I think we need to think about it from a perspective of uh, opportunity as opposed to a space of threat or concern of loss. And I think the way we think about things, right, our mindset, you know, I'm getting all positive psychology on us again, but the way we think about things makes a huge difference in how we act and how things end up shaking out for us, right? So I see folks from the boomer generation who are have worked very hard for very long and have done amazing work wanting to make sure that their clients are serviced and happy and content. And they're concerned that if they're not the ones doing the work won't get done. And I think this goes back to how are you building relationships with the people who are coming along? How do you bring them in and not be threatened by younger folks who can also do the work and may have a different perspective, but also bring them in to understand the history, right? Understand the longstanding relationship because also let's be honest, clients are also moving on. Clients are also retiring. And so if we want to continue to have relationships with our organizational clients, we want to be building relationships with the younger people in those organizations. So how can we see that as an opportunity to build closer ties as opposed to holding on to a specific relationship? I have seen instances where the succession planning hasn't gone so well, right? Because that hasn't, the the structure on both sides, on the client and the organization, have not made that transition down to younger folks who are going to be in the organization longer. And so where are our opportunities versus where is the threat of loss? And if we can be focusing on that and how can we continue to build that up, I think that there's so much more there as opposed to just a concern for what happens when I'm no longer with the firm and therefore I can't leave. I have to stay, right? When perhaps they want to do something else. Yeah. And I love, you know, your retying this to psychology again, because I think the empathy piece on the, on this part of what firms are trying to do is something that 
gets missed frequently because the retirements come in some strange way as a bit of a surprise (laughs) to the leadership or that's not fair. I'm going to reframe that and say that I think the law firm partnership model makes it very difficult to carve out (laughs) time to do all of these things that we're talking about. And then succession planning is one additional thing that requires intentionality. But what I see is, as you're saying, Jesse, lawyers who've spent decades doing amazing work, contributing to the firm, often at great sacrifice to their personal lives, and feeling because of the rush to figure out a succession plan, like their work is not being honored or valued, that they're kind of being shown mm-hmm. the door really quickly without being thanked for what they've contributed. So I think that time and being able to empathize with that group of lawyers in your firm. And also, as you said, you know, thinking about loss aversion and our human tendencies to be more afraid of what we're about to lose than what we're excited about what we can gain thinking about that and having conversations that are helpful at all levels about mm-hmm. all of the things that we can gain if we can figure out how to navigate the steps ahead. So that's super helpful. And I want to come back to you, Diana. We are, you know, on the cusp. We live in a VUCA world. When you mentioned VUCA, Jesse, I did a leadership program in 2019 where we learned the VUCA framework. And I remember thinking then, oh my gosh, the world is so complex. How do we get our arms around it? And that was 2019. Yeah. <laughs> so it seemed like, right? wow. And then, <laughs> and then, <laughs> little so did I know. squared right now. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. VUCA. VUCA squared. That's exactly right. <laughs> VUCA cubed. And yeah. So we will continue. You know, Diana, you said, where were you, Jesse, when we were going through all of this? I think the maybe good, bad, neutral news is that VUCA is going nowhere. Mm-hmm. I've heard people say, I can't wait to uninnovate or go back to the way things were. Things are never going back to the way things cool. were. And the world continues to be really complex. And so in the next five years, I suspect we'll see enormous changes again through technology, through geopolitical events, through things that we'll look back again to this recording mm-hmm. and say, weren't we cute that we didn't see this thing <laughs> that was about to hit us? So where do you see the profession in five years in terms of the dynamics across all of these generations as Gen Z continues to grow, the baby boomers continue to shrink as a population in firms. Mm -hmm. What do you see for the future in any respect of the firm's work? Well, it will be cute when we keep this and look back and see. <laughs> we'll, all in, we'll still all be in touch with each other. And perhaps, of course. You know, we'll see who is right. But I think I'm an optimist and I like to think that we will continue to be better and continue to learn and continue to implement these different things that we are learning. I think also as we have more of the, you know, these younger generations moving Up and being more, and even with Gen X's, I think the fact that they have been working with millennials and Gen Z's, and I think also they also have exposure to the internet and social media Mm -hmm. and everything. So I think they are also at a point where they can also adjust, right, and realize that they there's a need to adjust and sort of pass the baton. And how are we going to pass the baton? So I think with that optimistic framework, I think we'll see definitely just the permanent hybrid work environment. I definitely don't see as much as there are some, you know, entities or organizations that are trying to bring everyone back in. I don't see that really sticking, especially within five years. I think I see more use of the 360 or 180 feed, basically like the constant feedbacks. Mm -hmm feedback circles and use and implementation is sort of what we discussed earlier, Jesse, of making sure that the workforce trusts the leadership to implement that. I think I definitely see more transparency and more engagement and more flexibility, that those are sort of just going to be givens in our profession. And I think also examining ways to it effectively increase the above again because I think these generations are those are non negotiables, I think, for a lot of these members of these different generations. So I think law firms and really need to think of a way to continue to maintain profitability while still holding that because if not they're not gonna they're gonna have a difficult time attracting folks. 
And I think speaking to a topic that's near and dear to Jen's heart, I think we definitely see an increased use of exploration and implementation of AI Mm -hmm. and how are law firms going to further explore that and implement that in a way, again, addressing those sort of non-negotiables, but also maintaining profitability in that new world. So I don't know what it looks like, though. So (laughs) I feel like if I did, I'd be, you know, a rich woman coming up with other (laughs) predictions. But I think those topics are definitely, Mm -hmm. I mean, there's things we're all talking about now. I just think they're going to be continuing to, we're going to continue to talk through them and find ways to effectively implement that. So my hope is that in five years, we're further along in the full implementation of all of that. Yeah, absolutely. I think we've only just scratched the surface Mm-hmm. of the changes that are going to be made with AI, right? With generative AI. It's not going anywhere. Just like, you know, the internet, who needs it? Well, it, we really do. And we can't live without it at this point. So it's going to change the nature of work. It's going to change what we are expecting young lawyers to do, how they're going to do their jobs, how we train them to do the work, right? If AI can do some of the repetitive uh, tasks that we have been asking our first and second years to do. What are we going to give them to do in order to help them learn how to be effective lawyers? And so we have to rethink that. We have to think, rethink how do we train folks? How do we integrate them? How do we support them? How do we make sure that there is a future for our firms and legal organizations in the wake of all of the the ways that things are changing? How do we focus on our well-being? How do we make sure that we are creating diverse and inclusive spaces where people want to come and be their full selves, right? If we're not creating that kind of space, then we're going to have a hard time recruiting. Uh, Gen Z is one of the most diverse generations out there. It is the most diverse generation ethnically and from many different perspectives. So we have to have that focus. So in five years, I see things not looking very much the same. I think we're going to see a huge amount of change. And yet we're still going to see the same types of people who are driven to excel, who have a heart for serving others, who want the best outcomes for their clients and want to be part of an organization that is bigger than themselves. And the way it might manifest is what's, I think, going to be different. So, Well, thank you both so much. We will have to do a rewind podcast (laughs) five years from now and say, oh my gosh, remember how we thought this and then everything changed? To mark it on our calendars. I know, I know. (laughs) Right. That's right. But I just want to thank you both for such a fantastic conversation. I wrote down a few words that just, I think, bear repeating. One, Diana, you said optimism. I am also an optimist in the face of all the chaos around us, of the really sad news Mm -hmm. around us all the time. I really am optimistic that this moment gives us the opportunity to reimagine what our work and lives can be like in a way that we couldn't have conceived four or five years ago. And I'm also optimistic working with the next generation of lawyers. And I hope, uh, to Jesse's great point, that we lead those lawyers with empathy and also help the lawyers moving into retirement in the next phase of their lives through empathy, all of which the last two words I have require intentionality and time, both of which Mm -hmm. I think are really difficult in the law firm business model Mm -hmm. to accommodate, but are essential if we actually want to retain these great minds that come to our profession so they don't go down the street or down the internet (laughs) to another firm. And I want to recommend a book that I've been reading. I have no connection to the authors. I don't get a cut of anything, but I just started me- reading uh, Tomorrow Mind, Thriving at Creative Creativity mm. and Connection, Now and in an Uncertain Future by Gabriella Rosen Kellerman. And Jesse, you'll be very familiar with uh, Dr. Seligman from Penn's yeah. Applied Positive Psychology Center. But it really reinforces everything that you've talked about and helps guide organizations through really helpful frameworks. And so as you all are navigating the future, I just want to thank Jesse Spressart, who is the founder of Optia Consulting and works with law firms to think about all of this complexity and Mm -hmm. extend 
the time they have to think about it carefully. And Diana Cortez, kudos to you, my friend, for guiding your organization through such a challenging time and also doing top-notch legal work in the process. And congratulations on your new role as a partner at Morgan Lewis. I know you will continue to do great things as you lead the next generation and build your business there. Um, Thank you so much, Jen. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Such a pleasure. And I want to thank everybody out there for joining us. I know all of you are dealing with this complexity again, and I hope this conversation has been helpful and you can take some techniques back to your own firms and practices. And we will see you on the next episode of Fast Track. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on Fast Track. I hope you enjoyed this fascinating conversation as much as I did. Visit pli.edu for more insights, education, and resources for navigating this dynamic landscape. And until next time, stay curious and stay adaptable as we work together to chart a course into an exciting future.